This is the Talk Radio Europe Book Show with Hannah Murray. Joining us on the line now is Megan Purvis, who has won the Stephen Spender Prize for Literary Translation for her translation of Beowulf. She is with us on the book show to talk about her debut novel. She was awarded an Arts Council grant to help her research the book. It's called The Wages of Dying, and it's set between New York and New Orleans in 1920s America. It's officially launched on National Vampire Awareness day which is october the 30th welcome to the show megan thank you so much for having me it's a pleasure thanks so much for joining us so tell us a little bit about your your connection with vampires then and why you wanted to write a book (laughs) involving vampires it's you know it's funny i've not always been a vampire fan i mean i i like horror books i like watching horror movies um but i think Really, I'm probably more of a werewolf girl. Um, But uh, vampires, oh, there's just something interesting about them and and the way they move through history. I think that was the bit that kind of got me going, the idea of, you know, what if if someone with uh, morals or lack of morals in a way very different to our own uh, was still around and kind of what what would they care about? What would they do? Um, And so that was kind of, that was the jumping off point. Mm. And how about the setting, uh, 1920s America between New York and New Orleans? You hadn't been to New Orleans before, had you? No, I hadn't. Uh, it's one of those places that always, you know, there's such a, such a mythology about it um, that I've always been curious. Um, and then when I started writing it, I've always liked history. I read a lot of golden age detective novels. So, you know, between between the world wars, really. Um, and so that was something I'd always really loved. Um, and so when I was writing the book, originally, it was it was close to New York. They there they it starts on the East Coast, and, and it ends up in New York pretty quickly. But then after that, I needed to shift locations, it, it needed to fit a couple of different wrinkles for the plot uh and and new orleans was just calling to me so i went for it (laughs) uh being able to to visit definitely helped um there was one one scene in particular where people are running through a forest and after i'd actually been to new orleans i realized the trees are all wrong i've written i've written a a scandinavian forest (laughs) in the middle of swampland. <laughs> I think I need to fix this. <laughs> How funny. That makes a difference, doesn't it? Because it's, it's good that you went there and saw that because people from New Orleans would read the book and go, no, that's not right. <laughs> yes, I, I'm still, I'm living in terror a bit uh, because I, I have relatives in New Orleans as well. And and if I screw the details up, they will let me know. <laughs> oh. So in terms of the, the plot, did you have a clear idea of the characters first or the story, would you say? I would say the story, it it started um, in a completely unrelated way. I was working in a library at the time that uh, one corner of it had a, a problem with fleas. And so whenever we had to reshelve books in that area, we were all going, oh, God, you know, tuck your socks outside your trousers and, and try it and, because you would sometimes get home and find a flea on you. And that happened to me. Uh, I realized I was being bitten sitting on my couch at home and and killed it and then was sitting there going, oh, you know, if only we were like uh, ladybugs, ladybirds, they taste bad. So birds don't eat them. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be handy if I tasted bad so fleas didn't want to bite me? And and then from there, I was like, hang on a second. And, and so it all kind of came out of that going, what what if, what would it look like if if someone was poisonous to vampires? Hmm. Interesting. So tell us about some of the main characters in the book. Sure. So the main, the, the, my protagonist, although there are a couple of main characters is, uh, Ruby Davis, who is a, a young woman living in a small town in Appalachia. Um, she is a bootlegger. So she helps, uh, run alcohol that's being brewed in stills up in the mountains, back into town where it's sold there or passed on. And she has a fairly small town life and and is fine with that um, until shenanigans ensue uh, and and uh, 
kind of the bigger world is forced upon her. Um, she later runs into a, a young man named Jack, who is a doctor, um, an unqualified doctor. He did medical training, but never finished school <clears throat> uh, for for a mob boss in New York City. Um, and he's been sent out with a couple of friends to investigate some strange happenings to try to figure out, out what's happening with a power grab. And they run into each other. Um, so, so the two of them are the focus. They've got a couple of friends in tow. And then the, the big baddie is, uh, is a vampire named Jed who has existed since just before the civil war. Um, that's where he, he died originally. And he has since moved up the ranks within vampires. He has a little, an alcohol mini empire in in the states that he's very eager to hang on to, and and Ruby and some other unnamed characters are screwing up his plans. Mm-hmm. So, were you quite clear with that when you first thought of this story? Did you have a, a clear idea of what you wanted to happen and and how it would end, or did a lot of that come when you you started writing the book? Yeah, I've heard that. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I've heard that you're either a a planner or a pantser and in, in you fly by the seat of your pants when you're writing. Um, I'm much more of a planner. I did. I had a beginning very early on. I, I had a vision of what I wanted for the end of the story. And so it was a question of filling in the middle of it. That did change over the course of writing it. Just as you keep going, you realize what works and what doesn't. The characters flesh themselves out and you realize, actually, this choice I want to have them make isn't going to work. That isn't who this person is. So things get tweaked. But I would say I had a rough outline that I I stuck to most of the time. Mm. And were you uh, were you kind of surprised that you uh, ended up writing this kind of book? Or do you think it's been like years in the making and you always knew that this was the kind of book you were going to write? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not surprised that I wrote something with a historical setting because that is something that I love. The paranormal aspect of it, it wasn't something that I was planning to write about. It just kind of happened. But I think the larger issues in the book. I think a lot of it is about female anger. Um, and that's something that, that goes back to Beowulf. Um, I think my, my translation of it is very interested in women's experiences in a world where might makes right in, in a world of violence. And I think that's very similar in the wages of dying as well. I'm interested in how Ruby is making her way in this world and how she responds when the stakes get higher as they inevitably do. Mm. And tell us a bit about the title, the wages of dying. It is. That's a great question. And no one has asked me that before. <laughs> it is. It is actually a quotation from a 1970s poem that uh, Galway Kinnell wrote about his infant daughter. Um, he's he's watching her sleep and thinking about the passage of time and how that inevitably means loss. And uh, the last line of the poem, or the last couple of lines, includes the phrase, the wages of dying is love. And that line stuck with me, I think, because, you know, especially as a kid, I was a very, I was a very goth little child. <laughs> I, I thought about death a lot. And, and as a kid, the, you know, when I first learned about vampires, I thought, well, that would be great. You live forever. You, you know, you can learn every language you've ever wanted to. You can read every book you've ever wanted to. Um, and so I think for me, the wages of dying, the trade-off is the connections that we have as the living. Um, it means loss, but it also means love. And and that's the bargain. And I think that's what I'm, I'm trying to get out of the book as well. Mm. So have you already thought about your next book? Yes, I well, it'd be fantastic if people wanted to keep reading about what Ruby and her friends get up to. Um, I I am <laughs> champing at the bit uh, to do more if if they'll have me. Um, the other thing I'm working on right now, it's another historical thing. Um, it's a an alternate universe, alternate history where World War One didn't end. Um, and it's set in Europe and London. So I'm I'm on this side of the pond this time around. Wow, what an interesting concept. Where did you get that thought from? 
I think it was, you know, because there have been so many kind of memorial activities and and remembrances over the last few years about World War One, and then at the same time we have these these conflicts, um, you know, going on in the Middle East, especially America's approach. I won't <laughs> I won't swing too political, but <laughs> but certain approaches to to foreign policy or or violent foreign policy in other places, and it just kind of makes you think you know, is this the forever war? Is this the one that's never going to end? And and what would have happened if it, if that had started with what is really the first modern war? So, so it's, it's playing with that. Mm, interesting. Love it. Well, if people want to get a copy of your novel that we've been talking about, it's called The Wages of Dying, and it's published to coincide with National Vampire Awareness Day, which is October the 30th. It's available on our website, tre.radio. Megan Purvis, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much. The Book Programme, presented by Hannah Murray. Talk Radio Europe. The TRE Book Show is sponsored by Audible. Click on the Audible banner on the talkradioeurope.com homepage to download your free audiobook today. Terms and conditions apply. The Book Programme. Presented by Hannah Murray.